Good morning, happy Saturday, everybody. Thank you guys for hopping on to today's show. A little chilly morning here in Wisconsin as the fall weather kind of rolls through. It's my favorite. And today is gonna be one of my favorite topics because we are continuing our series with the Sleep Well Challenge. So let's get into that. Awesome, so good morning again to everybody. For those of you guys who do not know me, I am Dr. Bryce. Dr. Patrick is traveling again. He is at an incredible student seminar that we are hosting in Atlanta for chiropractic students all around the country. Uh, we're always investing into people, into students, our community, and all that fun stuff. And today, I thought it would be kind of fun to talk about the dreaded 2 a.m. wake up call. Okay, so this is an extremely common complaint from patients, people, you hear people on the internet, you hear your family members talking about their sleep, and we're talking about that 2 a.m. wake up call, and this is of course going to be a continuation of the sleep well challenge. So before we kind of dive into all the details, please go and check out our challenges page. So we have a Facebook page, the Wellness Way Challenge page, and we have various different challenges. So it originally started with our No Sugar Challenge, but now you guys see that we just got through our July Protein Challenge, and now we are talking all about sleep, because as you guys will see, and I'll show you today, sleep is absolutely essential for your overall health. It's important for detoxifying your body. It's important for cognitive function and so many other things. So one of the things you guys can actually do is go ahead and scan this QR code here. And we are always trying to give you guys different tools to help you in this process. And some of these packets are gonna have a lot of information for you to you know, sleep better, but also track your sleeping patterns. Okay, so these are all going to be just things that are gonna be beneficial for you and your journey with us here through this Sleep While Challenge. So before we get into all the fun details, we also of course are going to be giving away some things this morning. So let's hop over to our giveaways panel. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. We are so excited to be with you today. Um, we will be interacting with you, so please make sure you're commenting and chatting with us. Um, I'll be on Instagram. Aaron here will be on the ADP platform, and we'll have Dr. Lucas on Facebook. And Dr. Lucas, what are we giving away today? Well, I think a lot of people underestimate how their digestion affects their sleep, so we decided, why not digestion glandular? Great. Fabulous. Well, I've got two big things to announce, and I'm so excited. Um, our First one is our Academy winner, always a favorite. So today's winner has been passionate about health since she was a teenager and living a healthy lifestyle. She's now a mom of four and looking to pass that health legacy on to her family and others. So Tatiana Ferdui, welcome to the Wellness Way Academy. You've earned yourself a, a tuition award. So go ahead and contact us at giveaways at thewellnessway.com and they'll get you set up with our academy team, but there's one other thing. Hey, Kelsey, guess what? What? It's Dr. Lucas's birthday! Oh, oh yeah, it's 12. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. Looks like we'll be getting some coffee after today's show. Um, so awesome, well thank you guys very much. Um, of course you guys, we have our giveaways panel here that you guys see on camera, but we have a lot of other people behind the scenes. Um, we have amazing people running the studio, running the show, so make sure that you guys say thank you to them today as well because they are just as much a part of this as we are up here. Um, but today we are talking about sleep, okay? So here's the question that we hear all the time, every day, and it's Doc, why am I waking up at 2 to 3 a.m. every night? Okay, and this is the question that I want to help you guys answer today because as you guys will know, there are various causes and reasons for basically everything, right? You can have a stomach ache and there can be 150 different things that are actually causing that. Well, 
The same thing kind of goes with sleep, right? You can have abnormal sleep patterns for a wide variety of reasons, but the overall majority of people are going to fit into specific categories. And that's what we're kind of going to walk through today. So I decided, let's ask the experts, right? So I did what every person does, and I went to Dr. Google. And I asked Dr. Google, why am I waking up at 2 to 3 a.m. every night, right? The same question we're trying to answer here, and you guys can see that it can be caused by a range of factors, including stress, medical conditions, or slipping into habits that could interrupt your sleep patterns, like too many coffees during the day, I'm not guilty of that one by any means, or too much screen time before bed. And I don't disagree with any of these. I think all of these can absolutely contribute to abnormal sleep patterns. So one of the things I wanna do for a little while is just walk through these things because can these alter your sleep? Yes or yes, right? So one of the first things that we're gonna talk about, and you guys hear us talk about stress all the time. You guys are probably getting sick of it by now, but stress is obviously a major role here. So I just pulled up an article you guys can kind of check it out. I put the, uh, just the abstract there, so a little summary. Um, but type this into Google, the effect of psychosocial stress on sleep. A review of basically what they're doing here, it's called polysonographic evidence. So they're looking at your actual sleep waves. And what they found in here, this is a bigger study, and so they looked at 63 articles, and basically they found fairly consistent changes. So they saw a decrease in sleep, or in slow wave sleep, REM sleep, and sleep efficiency, okay, as well as an increase in awakening. So these people were waking up more throughout the night as they were stressed. And what I want to do, because we can throw around terms like slow wave sleep, REM sleep, right? Well, what do these actually mean? So I want to actually walk you guys through some of the phases of sleep so you can actually understand what we're talking about here. So when we talk about slow wave sleep, this is going to have a couple different names. Um, a lot of times people will call it like delta wave sleep, slow wave sleep, deep sleep, right? So when you guys think of this, think of deeper sleep, okay? So what is the function of slow wave sleep? Okay, so although researchers are still working to fully understand the purpose of each stage of sleep, experts believe that slow wave sleep has a wide variety of vital functions in the body, right? So we don't even know, um, right? Experts believe, they don't necessarily know all the things, but they are pretty sure of a couple things that are pretty consistent across the board here. And when we look here, it's talking about sleep pressure, right? So you'll hear this term every once in a while if you're looking at sleep, what does sleep pressure actually mean? And the easiest way I can explain this to you, for those of you guys who have stayed up way too late, you start doing some of these things, start getting the head bob, right? Your eyes just want to close. You have the pressure to sleep. So that's basically what they're talking about here. And what they found is that slow wave or this deep sleep actually alleviates that pressure, right? So go figure, the more good quality sleep you get, the more awake and alert you are, which comes with cognitive benefits. So you guys can see here other functions that they're looking at slow wave sleep, they're gonna include supporting memory, boosting immune function, right? Why do you think when you're sick you wanna sleep all the time? Sleep is important for your immune system, facilitating the growth and repair of tissues. People who are very physically demanding with their jobs, with their workouts and different things, you need a little bit more sleep because when you're sleeping, all those tissues are repairing and also detoxifying your body. So enabling the elimination of waste products. Who's gonna tell you that if you want to be detoxifying your body well, you have to sleep good. <laughs> it is vital for basically every single aspect of your health to be sleeping good, which is why when there's a lack of sleep, you can notice a wide variety of symptoms. And today I'm gonna help you guys understand some of that. But, right, Dr. Google talked about stress, it also talked about medical conditions. So I figured why not look at some medical conditions that can affect sleep and it kind of makes sense. Okay, so I just pulled up a list here from this article and it talks about a list of conditions, right? So you have stress, which we just talked about, but you also have depression, you have arthritis, back pain. So many people are just struggling simply with joint pain that it prevents them from sleeping. 
cardiovascular disease, dementia, including Alzheimer's, conditions that interfere with breathing, so asthma, sleep apnea, how many people in this country rely on a CPAP machine to provide proper airflow? We are sick, right? So you see my little caption there. What's the common link between all these? It doesn't matter if it's depression, arthritis, cardiovascular disease, dementia, sleep apnea. There's some sort of underlying inflammatory process that's taking place, okay? And when you have chronic underlying inflammation, your body needs sleep. So if you're not getting it, it's gonna perpetuate the problem. But another problem that we have is that with certain types of inflammation, say there's a lot of stuff going on in the gut, that can trigger these immune system reactions, which can actually lead to your brain being a little bit more excitatory. You tend to be a little bit more amped up. You might go to bed and you, know, you feel tired and then you still can't sleep. That's frustrating, right? So what are some things we can do to actually help with that? That's what we're gonna get into a little bit later. But now we need to talk about REM sleep. Okay, so we talked about the slow wave, the delta wave, the deep sleep, but what is REM sleep? Okay, a lot of people know that REM stands for the rapid eye movement, and this is actually the fourth stage of the sleep cycle. So there's four total stages. You have three different types of more deeper sleep, and then you have REM sleep. And what actually happens with REM sleep is that you actually have a lot more brain activity. Your heart rate starts going up, your eyes start moving all over the place pretty crazy, um, but it's a, it's a very important part of sleep. Um, so a lot of adults, on average, you need about two hours of REM sleep per night. And it, again, is still going to play a vital role in your memory, your emotional processing, your brain development, but also dreaming, right? So if you are someone who's getting some very vivid dreams, your REM sleep is likely playing a role in that. Now, you can still dream and stuff without REM sleep. Um, Experts are still confused on that, right? So they're still trying to figure out all these different cycles with sleep, you know, what phases do what, why they're important. And of course, we can kind of backtrack, right? If we know REM sleep is, say, important for your memory, well, let's start asking the questions. Are you someone where maybe you're in a conversation and you're losing your place? You're forgetting, you know, what you were talking about. You go into a room and you forget why you went in that room. It's like, okay, maybe you have a lack of sleep or maybe your sleep is poor quality. Those are questions we can start answering. And then emotional processing. Maybe you're someone who has a really hard time processing different situations. You have a hard time dealing with different emotional issues. You may have poor sleep quality because that sleep's gonna be extremely important in how your body's actually gonna cope with that. Okay, so now, Let's start talking about some more environmental things, some choices we can make, right? So you hear a lot of people talk about caffeine, right? Dr. Google said, if you have too much caffeine, it can interfere with your sleep. And of course, I completely agree with this, but this is where there's, again, gonna be a lot of variety. Caffeine is not gonna affect me the same as it affects, say, Dr. Lucas. Maybe I can have a cup of coffee, you know, three hours before bed and sleep like a baby, but if Dr. Lucas has one, you know, eight hours, he still can't sleep. And there are certain reasons for that, okay? Trust me, Dr. Lucas and I, were both good at drinking coffee, okay? Trust me. Uh, but caffeine, on average, should be avoided about eight hours before bed, okay? Reason for that is it does have to metabolize. It has to break down in your body and be eliminated. And a lot of that happens through the liver and the kidneys. So, Let's say you're someone where you can't have coffee anywhere near bed or you're up all night. You may wanna get some of these things checked out. You may wanna get your labs done and look at your liver, your kidney function, maybe look at how your body processes these things, process called methylation. You hear people who talk about methylation all the time, right? You say, I'm a fast methylator, I'm a slow methylator. Well, you know, there is some validity to that and there's certain reasons that happens, but look at caffeine. Okay, caffeine has to be methylated to some extent to get out of the body, okay? And if you are someone who has slow methylation, that caffeine might affect you a little bit more, okay? But again, it's gonna vary based on the person. Like I said, people are very individualized. There's different things that are gonna stress me out versus stress you out. 
Hopefully I'm not stressing you out this morning talking about not having coffee after the afternoon, okay? Um, but when we start looking at it too, I always tell people caffeine is gonna be best in the morning, okay? Because it can actually support your normal cortisol pattern. So this is something that's pretty similar, or pretty you know, standard, pretty self-explanatory, and people who are struggling with sleep typically aren't downing a bunch of caffeine before bed, but it's something I wanted to touch on because you know we're kind of breaking it down from Dr. Google here. And now, the last thing on the list was blue light. Okay, and this is something that's very commonly talked about too. And what does the evidence actually direct us to? Well, it is true, right? Does using a device before bed make it harder to sleep? Yes, it absolutely does. And it doesn't matter if it's your phone, your TV, if you just have all the lights on in your house, it actually tricks your brain into thinking that it is daytime, okay? So look at the second little paragraph here though. It says light from electronic screens comes in all colors, but the blues are the worst. That's kind of funny, the blues are the worst, right? So why do we have so much blue light, okay? We have blue light on our phones. The lights on me right now, you guys can't see it, there's lights on me, I have a computer here, there's blue light, okay? My brain is being tricked to thinking it's daytime. Good thing it's actually daytime, but at night, if I had all this light on me, that would really mess with the way my body is gonna make something called melatonin. So think about the sleep-wake cycle. When you wake up in the morning, your melatonin is not that high. It's actually pretty low and your cortisol is high. Cortisol and melatonin work inversely to each other. So at night, when your cortisol, your stress hormone is gonna be a little bit lower, guess what's supposed to be nice and high? Your melatonin. Well, what if we're bombarding ourselves with all these signals, these blue lights that are actually preventing our body from making our own melatonin? Do you think that could cause and interfere with our sleep, cause some sleep problems? Absolutely, so what can you do? Well, in my house, we turn all the lights down very low, right? We don't walk around in the dark as soon as it's six o'clock, especially in Wisconsin in winter. Once it hits 4.30 in a couple months, it's gonna be pitch black. So do we walk around in the dark? No, right? But we have minimal light. And then what you guys can do for your phones, your TVs, your laptops, you can start doing a little more red light. There's different filters. You can change the color scheme so it stops emitting so much blue light and it can actually have some benefits on your sleep, okay? But what's really going on here, guys? Did you really think I was gonna get through today's episode without talking about cortisol? I don't think so, okay? So this is what majority of people are having questions on, right? I just wanted to clear the air from Dr. Google, but now let's really kind of get into it. So what is actually happening when majority of people are waking up at two to 3 a.m.? And it's typically an issue with your cortisol. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean cortisol is to blame, but that cortisol spike will wake you up. So cortisol may be best known as the body's stress hormone, but it also plays a pivotal role in managing our sleep architect, okay? So I am one where I will say this, cortisol can cause problems, but cortisol itself is not the problem, okay? So I've done an episode in the past where I talked all about cortisol and what did I say? Don't shoot the messenger. Cortisol, right? Yes, it's the stress hormone, but what is it doing? It's responding to what? Stress, okay? So what do we need to do? We need to manage stress, of course, but we have to figure out what are these underlying inflammatory things in our body that can be causing that stress response. So when we look here, it says studies have shown that cortisol levels naturally begin to increase between two and three a.m. So it's part of our normal circadian rhythm. However, if you're already stressed out, whether it's from an underlying inflammatory thing, whether it's from work stress, family stress, or anxious about something, and your cortisol levels are already naturally rising, it's not surprising that you wake up, right? If you are stressed out and your sympathetic nervous system starts getting activated, it's gonna kick you into high gear, and that's actually gonna increase your heart rate it's gonna increase your blood pressure and make it harder for you to fall back asleep. So let, let me ask you some questions, you guys. If you are someone who's waking up at say two or three in the morning, maybe it's four, okay, what are you doing? 
Are you waking up because you are thirsty? Are you waking up because you just have to go to the bathroom? Okay, that's going to be a little bit different. Or are you waking up and you're in a little bit of a panic? Maybe you're sweating. Maybe your heart is beating out of your chest. Maybe your breathing is changed. Okay, this is a sign that your sympathetic nervous system is waking you up. Why? Because there's something that's stressing you out. Okay, and we have to figure out what that is and work to manage that and reduce that stress a little bit. Okay, but what else can be a contributor to this, right? Why, say it is your cortisol spiking, why is it typically doing that? Why is it 2 and 3 a.m. and not 2 and 3 p.m. in the afternoon? And here's why. Okay, it's typically something to do with low blood sugar. Okay, so this is a whole separate article and I just pulled up a little clip here and it says, do you consistently wake up around 2 to 3 a.m. and can't fall back asleep? Although the reasons for sleep problems can be complex, <clears throat> which I completely agree, okay, this isn't gonna work for everybody, they can be complex, waking up too early is often a symptom of something called hypoglycemia or low blood sugar and can be remedied through dietary changes and nutritional therapy. So I totally agree. Let's just think about this, right? Why doesn't it happen at 2 and 3 p.m.? Well, you just ate lunch. Your cortisol is supposed to be a little bit higher in the afternoon than at night. Okay, it's part of our normal circadian rhythm, but when it's at night, it's gotta be maintained. Okay, same thing, your blood sugar has to be maintained at a certain level. Low blood sugar will kill you a lot faster than high blood sugar. People live with high blood sugar and diabetes for 20, 30 years. Low blood sugar can actually kill you really quick, make you faint and pass out. So when that blood sugar, if it starts getting too low because you have abnormal regulation or you're typically not eating through the middle of the night, right? That blood sugar dips a little bit low. What's the body's defense mechanism to actually bring that blood sugar back up to normal? And that's where we look at the physiology of cortisol. So what does cortisol actually do? Okay, it's not just a stress hormone. It's extremely important for so many different functions of the body, and one of them is increasing and regulating your blood sugar. So under normal circumstances, cortisol counterbalances the effect of insulin. Okay, insulin is a hormone that your pancreas makes to regulate blood sugar. So most of the people who are familiar with insulin are people who have diabetes. Why? Because they have insulin resistance, or if they're type 1 diabetic, their pancreas is not making insulin, okay? So basically, imagine this. You're gonna eat some food, okay? And perhaps there's gonna be a little bit of sugar in there. I know none of you guys would eat sugar, but some of us, every once in a while, you know, we have a little sweet potato or something like that. I actually just had a little bit of sweet potato even in my breakfast today, because I'm doing a detox, so I need something to sustain me here. And when I ate that, my blood sugar went up. There's no doubt. What also went up? My insulin. Okay, is that bad? No. Okay, my insulin's gonna, my blood sugar is gonna go up, and my insulin's gonna go up to allow that sugar to go into my cell. Okay, and that way my cell can actually use it. So it's a lock and key mechanism. Okay, so that's what insulin does, and cortisol is actually gonna have a similar effect, but it's going to be on the opposite side of things. So the same way that insulin will lower your blood sugar, cortisol is actually going to increase it. So cortisol raises your blood sugar by releasing stored glucose, while insulin lowers blood sugar. Now, having chronically high cortisol levels can lead to persistent blood sugar, or high blood sugar, hyperglycemia, and that can actually contribute to type 2 diabetes. So I've seen this multiple times where people are so stressed out and they do have that cortisol response because if there's a lot of stress, your cortisol has to go up, it's a protective mechanism, but now your blood sugar goes up. That can actually lead to insulin resistance. I know people who don't eat sugar who are borderline type two diabetic. It happens, okay? So now, what I wanna do, we kind of understand a little bit of what's happening. We're kind of understanding the sleep cycle a little bit. We know that there's slow wave sleep, we know there's REM sleep, we know they're both very important for our brain, our memory, our immune system, the way our body is going to heal. And we all want to heal, we want to sleep well, but how can we actually do that, right? I don't want to bore you guys too much with the physiology of cortisol. We've talked about it at nauseum. 
but I want to actually talk about this because this is what you guys want to talk about, okay? What can you do to aid in good quality deep sleep? Okay, and here we go. All right, so first thing, let's talk about this. Magnesium, specifically magnesium L-threonate. And there are, of course, many good forms of magnesium. There's magnesium glycinate, magnesium citrate, and they're all going to have slightly different effects. But magnesium L-threonate is by far the most studied when it comes to sleep. So magnesium threonate, it is known for its high bioavailability and its ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. It can enhance sleep depth and onset and possibly support cognitive function due to its engagement with the GABA pathway, which turns off certain areas of the forebrain to facilitate sleep. Okay, so what does this actually do and what type of person may actually benefit from taking this? Okay, well, if anyone has heard of GABA before, GABA, think of GABA as very, very calming. Okay, and this is actually engaging in that pathway to actually support your GABA or calming function, which is how it actually helps in aiding in sleep. So if you are someone who struggles to simply fall asleep, this could be something that is beneficial, especially if you're someone where you lay in bed and your mind starts turning over and over and over and then you're just sitting there like, why is this happening? Why can't I turn my brain off? You may be deficient in magnesium. This may help to calm you down. And then what I did is I pulled up a research article and just took a little clip there in the bottom and this is looking at magnesium l 3 n in specific and how it improves sleep quality and not only sweet sleep quality, but when you improve sleep quality, you're going to improve your daytime function. Okay, so what did they conclude here? So this showed, so this study showed that magnesium L3 and 8 improved sleep quality, so how well people are sleeping, especially deep or slow wave and REM sleep stages. So it's not only focused on just one part of sleep, it's helping your deep sleep, it's helping your REM sleep where you're a little bit more active. Okay, so it's hitting both sides of things. But then when you have that good quality deep sleep, you have that good quality REM sleep, there's gonna be a lot of cognitive benefits. There's gonna be a lot of benefits when it comes to your mood and that's what they actually found. They concluded that it's consistent with how magnesium l 3 and 8 works with your neurons. So think of neurons as the cells of your nervous system, of your brain, okay? In animal models suggesting positive impacts on overall brain health, but also improved mood, improved energy, improved alertness, Right, so let's start thinking about how we can kind of backtrack these. Are you someone who has a lot of daytime fatigue? Do you have energy crashes? Do you have maybe some anxiety going on? Maybe you need a little bit of calm to your body. Okay, that's where magnesium l 3 and 8 can actually be very beneficial, especially in aiding with sleep, because if you correct the sleep problem and you actually get that good cognitive awareness, you get that mood enhancement, you can actually just have much better activities on a day-to-day -day basis, be much more alert, right? We all wanna be alert. We all wanna be engaging with the people we're around. We wanna be engaged in our family life, our work, okay? It's extremely important, and in order to do those things, you have to prioritize your sleep and make sure that all of your needs there are being met, okay? What is something else that we can do that's not even a supplement, right? How about olive oil? How many of you guys have heard that olive oil can help with sleep, <clears throat> okay? This is something that Dr. Patrick actually taught me, and I believe he's talked about it on here a couple times too, but how does it actually work? Okay, so olive oil helps as a natural remedy by bringing balance to blood sugar levels that are above the average with a high blood sugar count being a form of vasoconstriction and heart rate excitation Olive oil helping resolve this challenge is a major player in helping one fall asleep and stay asleep for a healthy amount of time. So what does it do? It actually helps to stabilize your blood sugar levels. And then not only that, I'm kind of a nerd and I was like, well, maybe there's more to this story. I agree that good healthy fats absolutely help maintain blood, uh, blood sugar and blood sugar regulation and 
Olive oil also has been known to have certain calming properties. So what I did is I went to a journal on food chemistry, which basically looks at what's all in the makeup of this food. And I found one looking at a bunch of different types of oils, and they found that particularly extra virgin olive oil had almost double the melatonin contents of other refined oils. So thus melatonin may account for the healthy effects of the Mediterranean diet in which olive oil is a main source of fat. So really what that article was looking at was why does the Mediterranean diet help with sleep and it's been shown to help people with insomnia. Well, what does the Mediterranean diet do? It decreases a lot of your sugar consumption, you're eating mainly whole foods, and you're having a lot of these healthy fats and olive oil is one of them. Turns out olive oil actually has a good amount of melatonin in it. Okay, so there are food sources that contain melatonin. And we're gonna talk here in a little bit, I'm gonna pull up the supplement bundle here in a couple minutes and we're gonna talk about some of those supplements there and you know who might benefit and why and what they do and the data behind it but there are food sources for other things as well. So when we talk about the sleep bundle, okay, we'll pull this up and you guys can see, um, I'm, a lot of you guys have already started taking some of these. We've already got tons and tons of messages, whether it's on Facebook, Instagram, email, all these different things of how people are sleeping better, their energy is better, their hormones are better, all these different things, but we have different supplements here. So, um, you guys can scan the QR code if you would like to get this bundle, but what this contains is, first off, L-theanine. And L-theanine is really what I wanna talk about today in a lot more detail because I think it's often overlooked and I think it's extremely important when it comes to the health of your brain and especially when it comes to, well, let's just be honest, people who are stressed out and have high cortisol. But you also have ashwagandha, California poppy and valerian. And all of these are going to work a little bit different and they're going to you know, support people in different ways. So one may not work for you and that just means that you need something else, right? We always of course recommend getting tested first, okay? Get your labs done and that will help us to provide you with the best recommendations. And I'm actually gonna show you guys some testing here looking at cortisol patterns and where something may work and where something may not work. And that's why it's always important to work with a provider. So when we are looking at these supplements, we're talking mainly today about L-theanine. I love L-theanine and I wanna show you guys where you can actually find it naturally, okay? Because a lot of times we jump to taking a supplement, everyone just wants a supplement, but first we have to make those good lifestyle habits. So when we look at L-theanine, L-theanine is an amino acid, <clears throat> okay? So it's a basic building block and it is mainly known for its relaxing and calming effects specifically on the brain, okay? But here's the big thing. It doesn't cause drowsiness. How often do you hear of people taking supplements and medications and things for sleep and basically what they do is kind of suffocate the brain from getting oxygen and then they chronically are fatigued. They might sleep good, but then they're still tired, they're groggy, they're drowsy, they still feel like they have this brain fog going on, right? L-theanine doesn't do that. It doesn't cause the drowsiness. And it also has been shown to cross the blood-brain barrier. And by doing that, it's able to increase GABA. So we talked about GABA being very calming. So when you guys think of GABA, think calm. So it increases your calming neurotransmitter but also your serotonin and your dopamine. So your more classical happy, feel good hormones, right? So all good things, but here's the thing that I love it for. It helps break down cortisol. So everything in the body has what's called a half-life. So basically that says it's gonna take this much time for this cortisol to actually be metabolized, broken down and eliminated out of your system, okay? So Half-life is just a calculation to figure out how long that's gonna be. What L-theanine does is it actually helps to break that down a little bit faster. And where can you find it naturally? Green tea. Okay, so this is why I actually talked about this a long time ago in my episode on cortisol. And I remember starting the episode and I'm doing it right now with a nice sip of green tea. Why? because my cortisol is probably a little high with all this blue light on me, okay? So when we start diving into the research here, I'm gonna show you guys 
how well documented L-theanine is and there are some pretty incredible studies out there. So the first one is actually looking at how this can protect your nervous system, okay? And here we're looking at green tea components, theanine and catechins, okay? So both of these are going to have slightly different things. Um, L-theanine is gonna work a little bit different than the catechins, I'm probably not even saying that right. Um, but I actually kind of want to walk you guys through this because this abstract is so unique. It's so cool at what they're studying here. So the neuroprotective effects of theanine and catechins contained in green tea are discussed. So this whole article is looking at just those two things. And what they did in this article is they literally tried to induce damage to cortical neurons, so this very particular cells of the nervous system, by poisoning them. And what they found is that when these rats were taking L-theanine, that damage was dramatically suppressed. So the death of hippocampal, so just a, a very uh, part of your brain basically, um, pyramidal neurons caused by transient forebrain ischemia in a gerbil, so not a rat, a gerbil, uh, was inhibited with the ventricular pre-administration of theanine. Okay, so very, very cool. And what they also looked at down in the bottom was that, you know, the whole, all the results of the study pointed that L-theanine was neuroprotective, protects your neurological system, but there was also a lot more because one of the things that they found was that one of the onset mechanisms for arterial sclerosis, so think of like arterial placking, cerebrovascular disease, all those different things, is the oxidation of LDL. Um, so a lot of people, that's a whole separate topic talking about LDL, but the oxidation of LDL is really what the problem is. And if you guys look at the little highlighted portion there, the oxidative alterations of LDL, so basically forming it into a more damaging particle, were shown to be prevented by T catechins. Scavenging of free radicals, so that sign right there means free radicals, so things that are gonna damage, was also exhibited by T catechins. Uh, that's a tongue twister. Say that three times fast and send me a video. Uh, the neuroprotective effects of theanine and catechins contained in green tea are a focus of considerable attention and further studies are warranted. So you guys, if you read a lot of research and it starts saying that, you need to have your attention on those things because basically the unfortunate part is that they're probably gonna try to isolate them, make them synthetic, sell it as a pharmaceutical, but that means that this is of significance, right? They need further studies, they need to look at this in a lot more detail and figure out how this works. So extremely, extremely cool things going on there. Now, here's another one that looked at L-theanine in specific with the consumption of anxiety, okay? So this is a systemic review, so they're looking at multiple different studies here and what they found is that there were significant improvements in reducing stress and anxiety. So what they did in a lot of these studies, they literally compared it against anti-anxiety pharmaceuticals, alprazolam, okay? And they, all the studies agreed that both L-theanine and the alazapram showed significant improvements in reducing stress and anxiety but then they actually said that neither of them were anxiolytic. <laughs> so not even the medication. Um, but L-theanine supplementation can assist in reducing acute stress and anxiety in people experiencing stressful situations. So what does this tell us? Think about yourself. Are you someone who goes through periods of acute stress? Are you someone who goes through periods of chronic stress? Right? It doesn't matter, again, if it's work, family, if there are just certain things in life that are happening, we can't always control that stress. There are certain things in life we can't control, and if you can't control it, you have to support it. You have to manage it. Does this speak to you? Am I talking about you today? Maybe. Okay, now let's look at some more. I got a couple more things I want to get through today because there's just so much stuff on it, and I think L-theanine is very, very awesome. Um, I love using it for myself, even just for you know more acute situations. 
Um, but here we have a separate article, and these are all looking at different things. So we went from neuroprotective to acute stress and anxiety, and now we're looking at L-theanine on sleep quality in boys with ADHD. And basically what they found here is that oral administration, um, I believe they're doing oral administration of this one, it might be the next one actually, um, but what they said is that this study demonstrates that 400 milligrams daily of L-theanine is safe and effective in improving some aspects of sleep quality in boys diagnosed with ADHD. Since sleep problems are a common comorbidity associated with ADHD because think of ADHD, it's often associated with very excitatory signals. What does L-theanine do? It helps to calm that response down. Um, and because disturbed sleep may be linked with the etiology of this disorder. L-theanine may represent a safe and important adjunctive therapy in childhood ADHD. Okay, and even in the first little portion there, just that last sentence, uh, in the results, L-theanine at relatively high doses was well tolerated with no significant adverse effects. It's extraordinarily safe. Okay, so anytime you hear someone say safe and effective, you need to go do your own research. And that's why we're providing you guys with all this research. But let's just kind of take a tangent here a little bit because when we're kind of talking about sleep, especially today's topic, waking up at two to 3 a.m., a lot of people this is gonna resonate with are either people with blood sugar issues or postmenopausal women. Okay, why? Because the adrenals are gonna be a lot more involved. There's gonna be a little bit more outputs of hormones at certain times. But L-theanine, in, in this case, we're talking about people with ADHD. How many people are being diagnosed with ADHD? Okay, because these people are also being affected from their sleep standpoint. So we see people with ADHD behavioral issues all the time, and what do we always talk about? We talk about sugar, we talk about the immune system. Why? Because the immune system, when it's very active, is going to increase the excitatory signals in your body. So we've been talking a lot about GABA. So think of GABA as calm, but your immune system creates something called glutamate. Think of glutamate as basically anxiety, right? Excitation. So ADHD, you have not enough calm, way too much excitation. So what can we do? We want to try to help bring this down and support this. What's something that does kind of both of those? L-theanine. Okay, it really does and it works very well. So next step here, we're looking at the stress response again. Okay, so basically this is kind of going to talk about L-theanine again a little bit more. It's talking about reducing uh, psychological and psychosocial stress. Okay, so the stress response, so we talk about that all the time. And this is just another resource for you guys to have. And it basically says, uh, this is the oral intake one of L-theanine, could cause anti-stress effects via the inhibition of cortical neuron excitation. So what was I just talking about with you know, ADHD, with people who have anxiety, they are stuck in this state of excitation. It's not, right, no one wants to have these feelings, but their brain is being sent all these signals that says, excited, excited, excited. What does that translate to a lot of times? Anxiety, poor sleep, behavioral issues. Okay, and L-theanine can actually cause the opposite of that by inhibiting that neuronal or brain excitation. So very cool. Now we have, I think this is the last one here. Um, so basically here we're looking at a little drink that they made, it had some L-theanine, but it also had some things like chamomile. A lot of people forget chamomile is extremely calming. A lot of people drink chamomile tea at night to try to calm down. Chamomile, our liquid herb, does the same thing, a lot more potent, but that's also something that can help people. But they're looking at the stress response of cognitive stressors was found to be significantly reduced one hour post-dose and cortisol response was significantly reduced three hours post-dose. Okay, so this is one where we start talking about that cortisol, right? So I had mentioned early on, you know, L-theanine is going to actually reduce that cortisol response. How? How does that work, right? Well, here's the article that shows you that and shows you that when you take L-theanine, it's not an immediate effect, right? You're not going to take L-theanine and have cortisol way up here and it's going to drop it down, but 
over the course of a few hours, think of it like going down the stairs, right? That cortisol is gonna start going down to the basement, it's gonna start slowly dropping off, and then you should be able to be nice and relaxed, okay? But we always talk about testing, right? How do you actually know if L-theanine is going to help you, right? Is, am I telling everyone to go buy a bunch of L-theanine and take it? Absolutely not. We always recommend getting your labs done. So I wanna show you guys a couple cases here of my patients and why I may or may not use this because it's only going to help some people. It's only gonna help someone who actually needs it, okay? So who's had their Dutch test done? I want you guys to put that in the comments right now. Talk with Kelsey and Aaron and Dr. Lucas over here. And I want you guys to actually let them know, hey, I had my labs done, or hey, maybe I haven't, but I want to, okay? Because you need to get this stuff looked at. So when we look at a Dutch test, this is page five. And if you look on the bottom right, what does that say? Your daily free cortisol pattern, and you can actually monitor your cortisol throughout the day. So this individual, their cortisol starts out pretty normal, if not a little high, and then the whole day, it's just pretty low, right? We can look at their total adrenal output and it's pretty low, okay? Is this someone I'm gonna go give a bunch of L-theanine to? No, right? Their cortisol is already down low, okay? If anything, this person might need a little bit of some stimulation there. Okay, so this is why your testing is important. Your testing is what's going to guide us. But now, let's look at someone who maybe could take a whole bottle of it, right? So here, this person is super stressed out. Um, I mean, when we're talking about adrenal output, I'm pretty sure this person's gotta be on some form of hormone therapy because this is so off the charts, but look at that cortisol pattern. The high end of the range is in black, they're over double the max, okay? The whole day, right? Even at night, it's double the max. This is someone who's gonna be in constant fight or flight, okay? They are gonna have a hard time sleeping with cortisol that elevated, okay? So if you guys are having problems with your sleep, if you are waking up in the middle of the night all the time, this is something you want to get looked at. Okay, if you guys have a Wellness Way doctor already and you haven't had this test done, ask them. Say, hey, is this something that I need to do? If you guys aren't a patient, well, we have offices all over the place that would be happy to help you guys get this testing. It's important for your health. It's important for your family's health to get these things looked at. Now, it's not only about the cortisol though, right? I had also mentioned another thing and that was blood sugar. Are you someone who suspects blood sugar issues? How do you really know? You have to get that tested. Okay, so here, this is pretty generic. Our lab testing is always going to include your fasting insulin, but here we have some, some blood glucose levels, your A1C, this person is definitely type two diabetic with these values, extremely, extremely high. Is this someone who is going to have problems sleeping? More than likely, yes. Um, their blood sugar is probably going to be all over the place. They may have a hard time sustaining normal levels and it may start to dip a little low and then they start having some problems. They wake up in the middle of the night. So get your hormones looked at, get your blood sugars looked at, but then also we have to talk about the other piece, right? Managing that stress, okay? So this is something I always like to talk about and I'm gonna do a little study with you guys here this morning and we're talking about managing stress. So levels of nature and the stress response. So a growing numbers of studies, not just this one, have shown that visiting green spaces and being exposed to natural environments can reduce or psychological or physiological stress, okay? And what we wanna look at and what they looked at here is they assessed three different environments. Okay, so one was like a wilderness-like characteristic, so basically think of walking in the woods. A second was a municipal type park, so think of still an outdoor area, maybe in like a New York park or city or something like that. And then a third one representing an indoor exercise facility, so a place where a lot of people commonly go to 
burn stress, right? To kind of take care and manage it, which I still think that's great. I still think that's important. And what they found is that visiting natural environments can be important and beneficial in reducing both physical and psychological stress levels with visitors to the natural environment, right? So walking in the woods, reporting significantly lower levels of stress than compared to the other two groups. So even a more modernized like city park, they're still not getting the full, you know, stress relieving properties as if you're isolated in the wilderness. There is something extremely unique and calming and connecting when you actually kind of isolate yourself a little bit, whether it's going for a walk on a trail where you're just getting away from all the buildings, all the stress. And what I'm going to do here today, I'm going to show you guys two pictures and I need some engagement here. I need you guys to tell me what you think. Okay. So they are going to be over there talking with you guys. I'm going to pull up two pictures. Okay. So it's going to be a couple slides. Tell me how you respond. So here's number one. What do you guys think of this? Okay. Keep that picture up there for just a couple minutes here. What do you guys think of this? Does this picture cause some cortisol response in you guys? Now let's go to this picture. Ah, how does this one make you guys feel? Brain's probably calming down a little bit. How about back to this one? <laughs> Stress, busy, work, phone, blue light, you know, all these different things. Throw on some kids in there sporting events, all these different things. Guys, take some time for yourself. Get outside, prioritize that time every day. Looking at pictures of wilderness is calming. Imagine if you actually just isolated yourself a little bit. Even if it's five to 10 minutes a day, just get outside, get some sun on your skin. Go out and stargaze, lay on the grass. I do that sometimes. I still live in an apartment complex. I'll go outside. I will literally lay on the ground. I'll be barefoot. And my neighbors walk by. They probably think I'm crazy. I don't care. I'm grounding. I'm getting the good benefits of that. And they think I'm weird, right? But hey, that's their own problem. I'm trying to heal. I'm trying to sleep good, okay? Um, they'll probably be up for a few hours. But you need to prioritize this time. It's extremely important. You need to take care of yourself. And I can tell you a lot of you guys probably don't want to do this. It's hard to find 10, 15 minutes sometimes, right? It's like, oh, I'm doing all these things. I don't really want to go outside. I don't, I can't, you know, I got kids. I got to do all these things. Bring the kids. Kids love outside, right? Bring them for a walk, bring them to a little park and just try to put the brakes on a little bit. So kind of closing up here, talking about sleep, right? What are our goals? Where are we trying to aim towards? Well, it's going to be different for guys and girls. Okay, guys are only going to need that six to eight hours per night. Women, you guys have a little bit more hormonal reserves that have to be built up. Eight to 10 hours per night is going to be best. And you have to remember this. Sleep is when your body heals. Okay, certain cells of your body are going to be way more active at night. They're cleaning up the debris. They're helping your body detox. Your melatonin, we talked about the blue light reducing that. But melatonin is not only important for sleep, it's a major antioxidant if you want to heal, if you want those free radicals, those inflammatory particles to get cleaned up, you need to have good levels of those things. It's extremely important. So if I can leave you guys with anything, it's to really take serious, at least this month, your stress levels, your sleep patterns. It's vitally important, not only to your energy, but to your overall well-being. Guys, get your labs done. Invest in yourself. Your health is the most important asset you have. If you lose it, nothing else really is that important. Okay, so that being said, thank you guys for hopping on. We are going to jump over to our giveaways panel again here, and they're going to go ahead and give some stuff away. That was exciting. I'm ready for a nap, but it's <laughs> just the morning, so. <laughs> All right, lots of great engagement and activity. So should we let them know? I mean, we could hold them here longer if we wanted to. We could, but... <laughs> I think we should tell them. All right, go for it. <laughs> All right. Um, so something special that we're going to be doing today, you guys, is that at the very end of the show, as soon as the show is over, um, the first 25 people to email, uh, email us at giveaways at the Wellness Way will receive a bottle of Digestion Glandular. So the first 25 people to email us get to win that. 
And please include the S on the giveaways. Yes, and your screen name if you're on Instagram, because some of those are fun. So go ahead and include that so we know who you who you are and all that sort of stuff. We love interacting with you and would love to get to know our audience better. Awesome. Hopefully I was you know able to help you guys out, give you guys a little bit more guidance into some of the challenges that you guys are facing when it comes to sleep. And of course, keep using all of our free resources. Make sure you guys go back, scan the QR code, get your sleep guide, join our challenges pages. There's people posting their stuff all the time on there wins, struggles, people needing help, people giving their tidbits and tricks and stuff like that. So make sure you guys go check that stuff out and we will talk to you guys next Saturday. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. Each week on A Different Perspective, we bring you the most cutting edge information on health you won't find anywhere else. For more information on this topic, please visit our website, a Different Perspective offers life-changing information and resources to share and explore. A Different Perspective is leading a health revolution.